Hello and welcome, folks, to another edition of RSF Radio. I am your host, Joe Monday. This is the podcast where we talk about what's been going on on the front page of our Street Fighter, but today I have a very special guest. Uh, You might know him from days of old, let's say. Uh, (laughs) I'm sorry if that's presumptuous, but... (laughs) I I, I love how accurate this is, yes. (laughs) Unfortunately. Or you might know him as that one guy who keeps telling you to play Guilty Gear ad nauseum. Uh, It's Patrick Miller, a.k.a. Pat the Flip on Twitter.com. What's happening, man? Uh, Not much. Thanks for having me on the show. It's been... uh... It's been a while since I was sitting in the guest side of the the interview chair, so this is super fun. Okay, I mean, like, let's kind of. When was the last time you were on the guest side of an interview chair? Um, so actually, it was when I was writing uh, about fighting games for Giant Bomb. Austin Walker, before he went off and started Waypoint, he had a uh, he had me on to do some work for Giant Bomb around fighting games because the folks over there really love fighting games, mm-hmm. but never really pulled anyone close to their orbit that had like a lot of experience with the FGC in the competitive side. And so I got to talk to Austin about fighting games, what they meant to me, and he's a great interviewer. Mm-hmm. Um, but since then, I've been more on the interviewer side of things. So I used to be a journalist and I used to edit magazines and stuff like that. Um, and, and interviewing was always one of the most fun parts of the job for me um and and since then i haven't had that many chances to be the the interviewee so i'm i've been super looking forward to this it's a it's a and the the rsf community has been super supportive of a lot of my work um so i felt like this was it was it was just a great opportunity to like jam with y'all wow uh that's that kind of spins off nicely into what i was gonna ask which is well first of all i was i was trying to do the math in my head of like when was like what year was Austin at Giant Bomb before he left for Waypoint? Like trying to work back the math in my head, like mm-hmm. five years ago almost, or like yeah. So I think I I was working with him towards the end of his stint at Giant Bomb, and that would have been around like 2014, I think. It's making me feel old. 2014, man. 2015, yeah. Fuck. Shit just keeps moving, Dude, man. Time is fucking relentless, and 2019, hell of a year. Uh, yep. <laughs> well, in in any case, uh, that does lead into the question of what you've got going on and what you've been doing because you haven't been sitting on your hands. Uh, you haven't gotten away from fighting games. People might say, "Where's Patrick Miller?" But I think you've come. You've you've made a comeback. I think. <laughs> It's it's true. So I never got away from fighting games, but I wasn't doing a whole lot of public work for a long time, um, mostly just because I had my own shit to focus on. Mm-hmm. Um, but what happened actually, so for the last couple months, I've been a lot more active in streaming, and then that in turn got me more active writing about fighting games again. So um, some of y'all might remember I wrote the uh, From Masher to Mas- Master. Uh, it's the It was a primer intended to introduce people to fighting games using Street Fighter and and kind of classic uh, Super Turbo and then a little bit of Street Fighter 4 uh, as, a, as a jumping off point for teaching kind of fundamental concepts about fighting games in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and I used to um, edit some, some feature content for SRK and all this other stuff. And then I kind of dipped out for a while because I had my own stuff to focus on. I was still playing a lot, but I wasn't in the content creation game, um, mostly just because my like, spirit, full-time job. Did the spirit of Marvel die in you? <laughs> I actually did. I wrote about that for Giant Bomb, and yeah, it's. I'm not going to ask that question and not know that, over. Pat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tossing softballs over here, please. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, um, good article, though, so, by the way. So yeah, so what happened was uh, I had gotten out of the content creation game for a minute, um, in part because uh, I realized that. Guilty Gear was the game that was really making me happy and really making me feel like it was respecting my time. And so I wanted to drill deep into that game, which like Mm -hmm. you could learn Guilty Gear forever. And uh, then I was boxing one day because I I, I do martial arts and stuff outside of just fighting games. I was boxing and I ate a super nasty left hook, broke my nose and I was out of combat sports for about a month. And I was like, well, since I have this free time, I might as well start streaming. And people just came through for Guilty Gear and for other fighting games. And and kind of it kind of reminded me how much I love talking about fighting games with people and just helping them learn. Um, so I'm back in the game now. Like, I've, I never really stopped competing, but I'm back in content creation. And it's a lot of fun. No, that's uh, I think it shows in your work as well. Uh, let me ask you this, because I don't know if this is documented, but when... 
when did you really get into Guilty Gear? What, what, sure. when did that bite you? When did you see a Potemkin do a touch of death on a chip and say, I want that to never happen to me? <laughs> so, uh, go back to the CVS2 days. So, CVS2 was the game that got me into competitive fighting games. I didn't know that there was a competitive fighting game scene before that. And I grew up in NorCal where CVS2 was super strong. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I played CVS2 for a couple years. Um, but I, I felt kind of like after a couple of years, I felt kind of left out because I didn't think I had the ability or the discipline to do roll cancels really consistently or do custom combos really consistently. I was just super intimidated by the level of play around me. Um, and it, it was after going like I like I think I went like two two at a tournament at Sunnyvale or something, and I was kind of down. And a friend of mine from the same arcade, his name's Ed Sheem, uh, was like, "Hey, there's this game called Guilty Gear XX. They just got a cabinet here. I really want you to check it out." I mean, I sat down. He showed me some stuff. He, he showed me like Faust and some of the the item gimmicks and stuff. And I was like, "Oh, this this seems this seems pretty cool. Like, I'm, I guess I'm interested." Um, I and then hold on, and hold then we on. Got I, have to, I have to stop you for a second yeah. Yeah. because I can't imagine imagine someone's life of the first time they see guilty gear is faust mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's one it's, hell of an introduction yeah it's it's i mean you it's know much. when you look at the xx cast i don't really know like who who would have been kind of the the normie introduction like soul and kai yeah we, we kind yeah. of say that they're some of the like more beginner or more conventional fighting game friendly characters but they're still wild as shit right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so I started getting the XX around then. I wasn't really that into it until it until we actually got at the barricade. And I got to dig a little bit deeper, and it was when I found a chip and just instantly like something about the character clicked, and it made me want to learn the game more. And so I kind of went deep on XX, and that was my main game for the next year or two. Um, and then when Sign came out, you know, like ten years later or whatever, right? And because yeah. I'd kind of followed XX and and you know going into Slash X and Core whatever, but when Guilty Gear X or Sign came out, that was when I got back into it. And then uh, I got murdered by it was I think Nerd Josh and uh, Mecha MacGyver playing Elfelt. Both of them were just running over me with Elfelt, and I remembered how bad it can feel to get hit to to have to deal with Guilty Gear mixups, and mm -hmm. I kind of stopped playing. Um, but then I played, so, and then Street Fighter V came out. I played a bunch of Street Fighter V, and there was this turning point where my wife told me, she just talked to me after a session of Street Fighter V, and she was like, you know, you actually, you're a lot happier playing Guilty Gear than you are playing Street Fighter. And I realized that, like, that was true. Um, so, like, I still enter Street Fighter V tournaments. And I still play the game every now and then. I still rock my Ryu, baby. I mm -hmm. saw the buffs in the, in the this season, and I'm kind of happy about it. But yeah, me too. Uh, that was that was kind of the turning point for me. It was just realizing that, like, yes, Guilty Gear is a complicated game. Yes, there's a lot of work. But if you're willing to do the work, it feels like it rewards it. And I really appreciate that, and especially as someone who's like. You know, we've been in, in fighting games for like a long ass time, right? CBS 2 was 18 years ago. Uh, and I don't need to be on like the new hotness. I want a game that lets me kind of uh, jump into it and, and hang out and play for years and years and years. And Guilty Gear is definitely that game. There's just so much shit in there that you have to you have to spend time with it. You have to take it slow. Yeah, like seriously, you'll. I, I see mix-ups where I go. I I have no idea how that person did that, or what my response to that would even. I don't even know how to begin to to respond to that. Uh, Absolutely, that happens like all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that game is that game is frustrating, but not in a this is impossible way, and it's frustrating in a oh my opponent did something actually pretty incredible and i fucked up whereas yeah. the frustrations that come from street fighter 5 it's like oh i know exactly how i fucked up and i feel kind of cheated for it right <laughs> that's uh, so that is that is the thing about playing guilty gear the, the experience of playing gear versus street fighter like street fighter lays a lot of it, it lays everything out on the table right there are there are a few mysteries when it comes to what what's happening in street fighter what could hit you and why right, right? Yeah. and on one hand, it makes it more approachable as a game because it feels like, oh, when if I get hit by something, I learn very quickly that that like I should have done something then, right? Right. But that also lays your own shortcomings uh, very obvious, 
right? If you if you miss blocking three overheads in a row, you're going to feel stupid because each time the game gave you the, the tools to block those overheads. Right. And in Guilty Gear, you're going to end, end up in a lot of situations where just figuring out what the hell happened requires you to <laughs> deepen your understanding of the game engine and the characters and all this other stuff. Yeah. And weirdly enough, that makes it feel a little bit more okay when you get used to that, right? Um, you'll get used to beating people just because they don't know what your character does, right. and you will get used to losing because you don't know what their character does. Yeah, there's a certain brand. It's a very particular brand of bullshit that I think everyone who plays Guilty Gear just goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that's just that's just part of it. Yep. Um, <laughs> there's, there's actually a neat analogy. So when it comes to martial arts, uh, I do a little bit of a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, but my focus is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is this very cerebral form of grappling. Um, if you've, oh, shit. Huh? Yeah, right. here? yeah, uh, yeah we're good. I, okay, cool. Um, sorry, my my computer uh, went in almost sleep mode for a second. Anyway, so I do good. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, and it's it's really it, it is kind of like body chess, right? So if you've ever watched the UFC, all the submissions tend to come from uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or kind of analogous submission fighting arts. Um, I also do boxing and kickboxing, and those sports are cerebral in their own way, but there isn't nearly as much like tech or memorization in those sports as there is in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So I just like fighting games that I can apply a lot of brain power to over time. Would you, um, I would like you to feel smart to give, when I'm playing these games. Would you be able to give a like a concrete example of something in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu where you might have escaped a grab, for example, or slipped into a, a hold. Is that something you'd be able to do? Sure. So uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is very, it's, it's, there's a lot of details. Um, part of, part of the sport, if you're competing in kind of the, the, the like most formal or like official ver rule set, um, you wear a gi, like, you know, it's a, it's like a judo gi. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually I think Laura wears parts of the jujitsu gi at different points. There's no outfit where she's wearing the full thing. Um, but holding on to the gi is considered a legal move. And it's those grips that you fight for that end up establishing a lot of your potential options off of that. Right. And as an, as a new player in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a lot of times you're going to ask yourself, like, how could I stop that choke from happening? Right. Uh, someone's going to grab you by the gi and then maybe like uh, sweep you down to the ground so that your back is on the ground and they get a dominant position. Maybe they're sitting on top of you and mount and then they and then they get just like a very simple cross collar choke and you have to tap or else you go to sleep. And a new player will ask themselves, how do I get out of that choke? Right. Which is a reasonable ask. And there are techniques that let you get out of the choke. But the most important part is understanding the chain of causality that led to you getting let that led to you getting in a position where they could get the choke. And that often starts with something as simple as they were holding onto your lapel in this way and you let them do that. Right. right. In Guilty Gear, you'll end up in a lot of situations where the ask on the defender is like, oh, you have to block low for four frames, then up, then high for five frames, then low again. And then if that didn't work, uh, then you need to blitz or something like that, or you need to time a jump out or whatever. And that's really hard. Right. Right. And so, so one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, well, how did you get in that position? Right. Don't be there. <laughs> and that and, and being able to work to, to understand that the chain of causality that led to that, which which could be like, well, why were you in the corner? I got hit. What did you get hit by? I got hit by this thing because I was, I, you know, I, I was mid screen and I jumped back because I was worried about this. Okay, well, instead of jumping back there and getting hit and getting pushed to the corner from that, maybe you should have tried something else, and right. so on and so on and so on. Um, yeah, it's funny. Like, go ahead. No, it's that I love that that train of thought because it wasn't the it wasn't actually the bullshit mix up that killed you. It was that you fucked up in neutral you air dashed right. when you shouldn't have or some you overextended like you can always trace it back to the time that you actually like you didn't have to end up there there were right. so many other mistakes that happened before that mix up i love that it's it's funny to me that like in in street fighter when you're teaching a new player street fighter the classic advice you give them is don't jump right and it's because as a as a new player, you quickly learn. Oh, jumping in moves me through the like quickly through the screen. I get to put out a big attack. If they did anything on the ground, I don't have to worry about it. And then you get dragon punched in the face, 
right? And and then you start losing from there. In Guilty Gear, a lot of the, the advice, not so much for new players, but for like intermediate players, a lot of what we tell them is to look at the screen. And it's because when you get to a base level of skill at Guilty Gear, your hands will have remembered how to do things that will probably beat new players. And then you'll get, you'll lose to, to more experienced players. And it just feels like they're faster and smarter than you. And when you look back at it, you realize that what happened was you didn't actually look at what was happening on screen before making a decision. And it's, and it's that kind of depth and complexity and the simple massive stuff that you have to learn in gear to start playing effectively. Like, it feels rough for the first couple months off often for the first couple years it's it's like it's it's a hard game to get into especially if you're not if you don't have the right community to play with um but you get to feel your mastery really grow in this very tangible way and it's super cool right i actually man I you actually... Play with me? welcome welcome to come by i'll show you the ropes oh man uh i would actually if i had if i had the time i would mm -hmm. uh but i I always get stuck up on that advice of telling Street Fighter players not to jump because I feel like that advice is so limiting. Mm -hmm. I grant it like, because there are times where it's like, Oh, you actually, you do need to jump. Like yeah. there are, there are, or at least teach someone the difference between a bad jump and a smart jump. Yeah. Or like that neutral jumping is a thing just saying, Hey, yeah. don't jump forward. Just jump directly upwards right um, so so it's, so what usually happens to me when i tell someone that is they go okay and they stop jumping and then we have to play footsies but they don't know how to play footsies so they just get swept a lot and they're like hey you told me not yeah. to jump but it's, right like <laughs> yeah yeah that so, that, yeah, that is exactly what happens don't actually. jump <laughs> Once you teach them don't jump, then you have to go through a whole bunch of stuff and then you get back to, so the way I usually teach it is don't jump so we can learn footsies. Okay, what beats, like how do I win in footsies? Well, you can counter poke, you can whiff punish, or you can throw a fireball, right? Okay, now you're throwing a lot of fireballs. It's really hard to deal with. How do I deal with this? Now you jump. Right. It's like, how do you teach someone the value of just walking forward? Mm -hmm. Like at, at a very intro level, players don't players forget that you can just walk forward yeah it's crazy um but as far as things that most players don't understand uh tell me about this game called unis what is a unist and why should i care <laughs> about it yeah so shout outs to undernight in birth exe latest um <laughs> aka unist uh if so if y'all don't know um unist is the newest game added to the evo evo roster uh, it is, it hit, it actually has a very kind of awesome legacy in fighting games. So the studio that yeah. developed it is called French bread and they're an indie studio. Um, you may have heard of melty blood is the other, uh, is, is kind of the older anime game that came from that studio. And I've always been really impressed with that team's ability to build amazing fighting games with what are basically indie development constraints, right? They're not yeah. working with Capcom money. They're not working with Arxis money for the most part, you know? Um, they don't have like any money. Yeah. And uh, despite that, they make really cool games that aren't, uh, they, they're, you know, they're, they're very anime, but they're not like Guilty Gear levels of kind of over the top, right? Unist in particular, I think, is a really good bridging point between a lot of current 2D fighting game communities because on one hand, you have a lot of the, the flexible combo systems and the like complex meta systems around stuff like the grid gauge, for example, um, that anime players coming from Guilty Gear, or Blaze Blue, Dragon Ball, whatever, will really enjoy. But the neutral in Unist feels a lot more like Street Fighter with really big buttons. Right. So right. imagine Street Fighter if you had more characters that had like Dalsim or Minot ish buttons. Right. Um, but there also is a good of, movement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the movement tends to be much more grounded. Yeah. Um, you're, you have to play footsies in that game as, as a significant part of neutral. Um, it's just you're playing footsies with anime style tools instead of uh, like more, more traditional Street Fighter style tools, right? So the character that I picked up about a week ago, his name's Chaos. And his shtick basically is that he has this super cool dinosaur friend um, and that's his puppet. And all of his special attacks come out from the puppet, not from where Chaos himself is. Mm -hmm. So we still have to play kind of traditional footsies, but you have to deal with two characters now, 
right? Um, and yet, despite that, so you wouldn't you wouldn't imagine that as very Street Fighterish feeling, but I still find myself doing things like looking for whiff punish opportunities yeah. or walking forward and blocking and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, that is the weird thing about that game is that I feel like it's it's someone who just if you were to show that game to to just random if you were to show that to someone's mom they would say oh that's a bullshit game that's a <laughs> that's a that's a game that is in like un, incomprehensible but mm -hmm. you put that in front of some like you put that in someone who actually knows how to play street fighter and you put it in their hands and then you say go it might not immediately make sense cuz there's a lot of meters going on but as soon as you get ha the feel of it you go uh, oh, okay. All right. this, yeah. this makes sense now. It takes it's, a minute because it, there's a lot it, of bullshit flashing. There's a lot of anime happening. There, there's a lot of stuff going on. Like they do. I'm actually from a craft perspective. I'm really impressed with Unist because yes. they do a lot to make the game feel uh, like exciting and flashy, but not in, in, in like ways that are from a development point expensive. Right? right. So one thing they do that helps kind of add to the texture, the hit sounds and the screen shake on a lot of the like on the, the heavy attacks and a lot of the specials does a lot to give the game this kind of visual texture and this the it, it sells the hits really well. Right. But it wasn't like they had to spend a whole lot of money on developing that stuff, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there, it's, it, it's got a certain like stylistic uh, consistency to it that I think is really cool. I was talking with an old multiplayer who live who who's part of kind of my, the local FGC. And he described it as almost like the third strike of anime games, right? Hmm. Grid system and the way that informs neutral and the way that informs player interactions and risk reward feels kind of, it's, it's weird in the same way that parry is weird. And the, the aesthetic that Unist has where it's, it's always nighttime and you're, you're playing with characters that are generally like fighting game versions of like anime high school kids like there's a consistency to that that isn't always there in a lot of the other bigger games which is right. I, I really i think if if unist is your thing it's probably very much your thing the, the other thing that i will say about it is that even though it didn't have a huge budget it has one of if not the best uh in-game tutorial mm -hmm. of any fighting game of like any modern fighting game uh at least the one that came out with uh with the latest release of unis which came out last year um yeah i've been super impressed at the the depth and the complexity that they're that they to which they go to in just yeah. the tutorial stuff yeah, right it, they teach like the the whole throw option select situation which is it's very in depth in that game mm -hmm. like there's a lot of different situations that can happen off of like someone jumping in per se uh how to not eat a tick throw or how to escape certain throw situations it teaches you all of that and and it actually like tracks exactly how you do your inputs so mm -hmm. like let's say it, the object of the tutorial is to uh, like tech a throw let's or escape a throw yeah and it's it's saying you have to do this very specific line of inputs in order to avoid this specific situation if you just tech the throw the way that you would you just press the button it doesn't work it has to say no you have to do it this way because we know what you've been up to <laughs> yeah even little stuff like just showing the frame count on how long yeah. you you held a direction in the input display i'm like oh this is really nice like you can tell that unist was made by people who know what the game is they're making, right? They're not making this for yeah. uh, like a super casual crowd. This is probably not gonna be your first fighting game, but if you're invested in getting good, they will give you the tools to do that. And I thought that was super cool. Yeah, it's one of those things where, man, I have said, I have said this exact thing into this microphone a number of times, but it is, it feels like a crime that the easiest game to get into street fighter five, I think mm -hmm. has lit like basically no tutorial or if anything, like a harmful <laughs> tutorial, yeah. whereas Eunice, which is like the least accessible game that first blush actually has the most accessible tutorial. It, it feels like a crime. Is that a crime? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's I, I would describe it as a difference in philosophy, right? Sure. Like, Unist is a game that's made for a fighting game player who knows they're a fighting game player. You know, you know what you're about 
and you you know exactly what you want, mm -hmm. right? I think Street Fighter is made for people who love Street Fighter, and some of those people are competitive, and some of them aren't, right? And yeah, I don't, it, I I have no idea what it's like being on the Street Fighter dev team, but I I wonder like how well they know the different segments of their players, right? Because there's clearly a competitive community that loves Street Fighter for, for all its competitive fighting game crunchiness, right? And then there's a lot of people who just want to have fun pressing buttons with, with Ryu and Ken in the gang. And striking the balance between those two audiences must be hard, right? That, that, that actually seems accurate because you can look at the changelog and probably... I mean, I you know that they're looking at all the data that they've collected from the CFN because mm -hmm. you look at the change log and it's like, oh, why would they buff Cammy? And it's like, well, she actually doesn't perform well at at these certain levels, so obviously right. they buff Cammy. But also, maybe Cammy needs buffs. That's that's like I that's my <laughs> controversial platform in twenty nineteen. Yeah, that's that's the hot take coming out of this podcast. <laughs> I I maintain I hey I read Glenn's aka the Game Two K's book and I maintain maybe Cammy needs buffs. So I think that the approach that Street Fighter takes is it's certainly like if I, if you're a competitive player looking to invest yourself in a game right uh, or like a would be competitive player like Street Fighter doesn't give you that many tools to be able to do so that they've gotten better right like being able to show frame advantage and disadvantage on training mode that kind of yeah, stuff really is really cool. cool. But I think there is something to be said for uh, not showing a player how, like, not showing them the mountain or the top of the mountain when they're sitting at the standing at the bottom, right? Like most of us who got into fighting games, at least in the old days, we got in and there was a moment or two where we were allowed to feel like we were the baddest in our friend group or in our arcade or in our city or whatever. And it wasn't until we get, we plugged into the tournament scene and kind of got our eyes open to how good people can get that we realized we sucked, right? Yeah. I think it's really important for, for people to feel good at a fighting game. And if you jump into Eunice and you start immediately grinding through the, the tutorials, there's gonna be a lot of times where you don't feel good at a fighting game, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's a difference in philosophy. I have no idea like w whether whether the Street Fighter team would consider it as oh this paid out or not. Um, but certainly as a as a player who wants to be able to easily learn what a game's about, I appreciate Eunice's approach for what it is. Oh yeah, I think with with, with what they were given and probably the budget that they had, they that game is phenomenal in my opinion. Uh, and it's it's like not super expensive what it i didn't is it like is it only a 40 dollars game or is it like uh, reduced to 30 or 20 at this point it's it's I'm bouncing sure around it the, the i think that the retail price it's pegged at is 40 i picked it up on psn uh, for my ps4 a couple days ago and it was 40 bucks there but i think there have been on and off again sales and stuff so generally hover, hover, hovering around 30 or 40. Okay. Yeah. No. On PSN, if you were to download it, it is it is straight fifty at this mm -hmm. at this time, which is that's that is a fair price for that game because it. I don't know if it's the final version of that game. My assumption is that it's the final version of that game because that game came out at least in arcades in like 2012, which mm -hmm. seems like man, fucking 2012. That's like when I started. Mm, that's like when I, mm, I'm not gonna age myself <laughs> on this podcast. But, uh, a long time. It feels like a long time ago. Let's say that much. Uh, well, anyway, I think that that leads into a a good conversation of where Street Fighter Five is right now and where mm -hmm. people's interests are. Because you brought up a good point that Street Fighter Five does have it casts a wide net. There are a lot of people who are interested in Street Fighter Five. Uh, what people don't actually seem to be interested in, though, is the Street Fighter League USA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was so I've been following the announcements for Street Fighter League a little bit, and 
on one hand, it is it is nice to see that Capcom is continuing to try different things um, and to, to keep yeah. uh, energy and attention going into Street Fighter V um, because to just leave the community hanging would definitely not feel good. But I, I saw the the way that the team process works and that the three v three format and character bands and and like I gotta say personally, like to me, I don't think that plays to to Street Fighter strengths as a fighting game. Um, I'll be interested to see what happens, but like. It's. I don't think anyone's been able to make sustained teams and and like team formats work in a fighting game, and it, I don't think it's playing to SF strengths. I, I, I disagree with that. I actually think that the team format works very well for Street Fighter Five, uh, mm -hmm. but particularly the character ban, in my opinion, doesn't make sense. Uh, specifically because I think that the team format can lead to a lot of fun situations that are. So here's like my galaxy brain look at it, right? Yeah. Is that I don't actually think that, and I could be totally wrong with this, uh, I don't think that the SFL is supposed to be marketed towards people who know about the fighting game community at all. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's tapped in. In my, in my brain, I think they can't possibly be trying to pitch this towards people who are in the know. Mm -hmm. it, it they must be trying to go after the like even like looking at the Facebook like or people who follow Street Fighter on like Facebook it's like 2 million people which sure. like that's a big fucking net maybe yeah. they're trying to get some more casual audience into it by introducing some like things that other people are used to from other esports right? sure like character bands oh that makes sense for a, a, a dota or a legal or whatever the fuck uh and that's something that i can relate to as someone who is into other esports uh, sports uh so i will be interested in that in the street fighter maybe i don't know but the problem is that i don't think anybody knows about it like yeah. At all. Because let me tell you, let me ask you this. I asked this uh, to Persia and and she didn't know. And I think that was very telling. But uh, have you been following the SFL Japan? No. So the only thing, the only way that I personally have been kind of passively following SFL is seeing people talk a little bit about like, oh, the, the, like, should I campaign for this? Right. Cause there's the community, uh, like the community elected portion of right. the qualifiers. Right. Um, and it was, it was starting to see that was when I started looking at some of the other stuff around the format. And I remember seeing some, some content around the format earlier and talk about the character bands. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you were right about SFL positioning SFL as a way to appeal to other esports fans, right? Like, oh, Overwatch has teams, League of Legends has teams, Dota has teams. Maybe we can try teams in Street Fighter V and see if that gives people a like a, a convenient access point to get into the game. Um, the challenge, I think, is that whenever you, so for an engaged Street Fighter player, the the hype is in the tournament season. Right. And it's seeing like seeing the top eights and the top 16s or whatever of every major tournament, seeing some killer come out of nowhere and, and you know, like get some upsets on his way to the top and then seeing how that culminates at Evo and then how, how th those storylines pay off at Capcom Cup. You have this really strong narrative around the year, uh, the, the tournament season for Street Fighter and SFL stuff. If you if you superimpose that on top of the tournament season, it gets confusing. Right. Because now you've got two you've got storylines happening in two different layers. Yeah, I think I think that they are two separate tracks. I don't actually think they're supposed to intermingle whatsoever. Yeah, uh, I think they're supposed to be sold to two different people entirely. Um, but like, to, like the SFL Japan has been going on. Like it's it, it's a thing that has existed. They do a, a much different format. In fact, uh, I don't okay. know if you're familiar with it, but nope. Okay, okay, so they they do it in such a way that it's not top players uh they have top players uh who are the team captains okay right? and then they have a uh intermediate level that is people who are they had to like do tryouts and then they have a like celebrity level where they bring in like japanese celebrities sure yeah and they like did a whole tournament to decide who would be viable for that so like they only play against the people in their level and mm -hmm. they, like points are distributed that way so it becomes like a oh the the pro teaches is supposed to like be teaching the people who are underneath them 
and it like those are the storylines that come out of that yeah uh, and there's been a lot of fun that has been at least uh from what i've seen translated from doc fugu shout out to doc fugu uh come out of that i don't i don't know i don't know if i trust the usl sfl usa man there's just a lot of letters to spit out <laughs> uh, because i you can't say sfl na because otherwise those canadians will think it's open up to them and it's not fuck Ooh. you trudeau get out of here <laughs> no yeah i think so i i like to look at uh stuff like pro wrestling and the UFC as an example for how you can tell stories and market an entertainment product around a fighting sport. Right. Um, and when you look at the UFC, like the thing that you described in, in Japanese SFL feels a lot like the ultimate fighter, right? The UFC was in a, it, it was in a, a challenging position where they were like, it's too expensive to do a UFC every time we want to be on television. Right. But we need a weekly show to get to keep people engaged with the product. So let's solve that problem by creating a reality show where you can incubate new talent um, and introduce them to the people who want to tune in to UFC content every week mm -hmm. on this reality show. And then the ones that do well there, then we'll start putting them in the main product. Right. We'll put them in the UFC, right. like either the numbered event pay-per-views or the fight nights or whatever. Right. And so they have this, they have a lot of different points at which you can interact with mixed martial arts and their version, their competitive version. Right. Um, Street Fighter is big enough that I, I wish they were capable of doing that stuff. Right. Where you treat the main tournaments as the pay-per-view and that's where a lot of the big stories come from. And then you do, you do other stuff that builds up to that. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like, Street Fighter and the business of esports is not the UFC, right? Like people are having a hard time making money off of esports in general <laughs> across the industry. Yeah. So I'm I'm happy to see SFL experiment and I hope they do some cool stuff. Like one of the things I do like about a team format is it I, I think of fighting games as very cooperative, right? Like when you when you see two people play each other in a fighting game, even if they're on the Evo grand stage or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you still you often after the match, you'll see them ask each other questions, right? Mm -hmm. And they're not mics. You don't get to find out what they were talking about. But a lot of these games are really cooperative mm -hmm. and teams just kind of bring that element out, right? Um, as a player, I, I would love to participate in team formats where I actually have people that I consider like my genuine training partners and I'm invested in their success. Um, but man, like that's just like, you describe that as a way to pull in uh, new viewers coming in from other esports. I wonder like how, uh, how effective that approach is gonna be for classic fighting game players who might just wanna see two people talk shit and get hit, you know? Yeah, I'm uncertain. Cause ultimately I feel like that's the crowd who's gonna crowd around it is the mm -hmm. people who just want Tuesday to happen every, every day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's fine. It's to a degree, I suppose. Uh, but in my mind, I don't know, because in my mind I have it looking like if I were to do, and I've, I've been brewing this idea in my mind for a while, but and I'll mm -hmm. try to, um, uh, get these ideas out here into a microphone, but I've been trying to think of a way to like, how does esports in the FTC work at like a local level, like an, an interlocal level, because I look at things like uh, high school sports, where you have a region of schools that compete against each other. They're on a schedule, right? Mm -hmm. And what is stopping us from, we know where the locals are. At least, at least we know where the big locals are. Uh, at least from my perspective, having run our Street Fighter and just, I know where uh, I got a big old list, and I know where to find other lists. But yeah. anyway, I know where they exist. What if we take those lists and we say, "Hey, bring five people on this date. You will play against these five people from other local." And we're going to keep track of all of that. It doesn't have to be streamed, maybe. Or maybe yeah. you guys just stream it and you promote it however you want to promote it because it's it's your local. Fuck it. Uh, and maybe then we have, like, we keep track of all that. I'm just trying to create a network of locals so that it's, like, so that it's, so all the esports money just isn't at the top trying to pitch something that they've created instead of being like, hey, uh, maybe the people who've been doing work can get 
uh, some recognition, much like the Unist people who there's yeah. no esports money or has not been for ever. <laughs> and look at what they've made. What if what if we tried what if we tried something like that in Street Fighter or uh, more palatable, less anime games? Let's say. Yeah. I don't know. I think so. That's a that's a cool idea. Um, and it's like team formats have had a whole bunch of success in different incarnations for fighting games, right? Like Cooperation Cup is the classic team tournament that everyone watches, yeah. right? Not just because it's the, one of the most fun third strike events to run every year, but because the team format does actually add something to the hype, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's a lot of really cool things about what a team format does to like uh, the meta around character selection, right? In, if you look at a tournament, um, the characters that are considered top tier in terms of tournament play are the ones with as few bad matchups as possible, right. right? Because you can't control who you're going to play against. And if you lose twice, you're out. So you need to minimize your chances of losing at all, right? But what you see in co-op cup is in a, in a team format, you can actually have some off meta picks do really well because you don't need them to win the tournament. You just need to beat more than one person for them to pay off, right? Um, and so there's a lot more... Uh, ability for players to specialize and for players to diversify their play style in team formats compared to individual like double elim or single elim. Um, and the, you know, the flip side of this is like when I got into fighting games and I, I used to play like little league, like soccer and baseball as a kid. And my least favorite part of playing those games is playing on a team because I knew that if I was going to fuck up, everyone on my team was going to hate me. Right. I was acutely conscious of how I was the worst possible player to put in any slot ever. Uh, I actually have a picture of myself that, you know, when they're taking the action shots for baseball, the photographer asked me, like, so do you want to be swinging a bat or catching a ball? And it's like, fam, just put me on the bench doing my math homework because that's what I do here. Uh, oh, and so my dad still has this picture on his mantle of me sitting on the bench with my math binder open. I wasn't even good at math. I just wanted to get my homework done so I could play video games. Uh, uh, I relate to that so much. I relate to yeah. that so much. My, so parents, like, my parents wanted yeah. me to play baseball and they, they pushed me into baseball, right? But mm -hmm. also what they didn't tell me until much later in life is that when I was born, I had a hemorrhage behind my eyes and I don't, oh, no. I don't have depth perception in the classical sense let's say. <laughs> oh shit and they were like yeah go ahead play baseball he, he should play baseball i can't hit a baseball to save my goddamn life because well, i can't see it come i have no idea where it is I have, I have no idea and they knew that so i just i imagine my parents sitting on the bench going <laughs> my dumb child <laughs> Fuck baseball. <laughs> I, I would love to talk to your parents someday. Um, Fucking rude. <laughs> yeah. So I think like for fighting game players, it wouldn't surprise me if a significant part of what makes the game feel good is that we win or, or lose based on only our own merits relative to our opponents. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so in that regard, like even though team formats can can produce a lot of really cool stuff, right? Co-op cup, uh, I forget what the Tekken, I think in Master Cup is the Tekken uh, team tournament. Mm -hmm. Like it creates a lot of really cool moments, but fundamentally like Street Fighter players are probably playing Street Fighter in part because like they don't want to be on a team, right? right? Um, and so, yeah, again, figuring out like who is the audience for this and how do you design for that audience and how do you design a way that design the esports program in a way that plays to your game's strengths is a really fascinating question that like, I think fighting games have figured out that tournaments are hype and that's kind of about it. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tournaments and Marvel, right. Tournaments and, and high stakes <laughs> money matches. Like that's, that's where hype is for us. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I would even almost spin it off into a conversation I saw on Twitter today talking about, hey, what if we change the bracket format to, mm -hmm. let's say, run Swiss bracket up until yep. top eight? And there might be arguments for that, but ultimately it lands on a uh, it's logistics for mm -hmm. the FTC and also what's there's a little bit of hindrance and competition because what if someone is – pretty much locked out of getting into the next round, but have to play against someone who needs a win. Right. I see some, some fixing happening or at least some like uh, lack of competition or something that the FTC historically and generally does not respect. Uh, and these are the players who are coming out to events and supporting events. So it's like, 
for the people running the events, why would you change what they're used to or what gets them gets them paid let's say yeah um, sure i mean the tournament format is convenient for a lot of reasons right like the rules are pretty clear especially once you once you learn what the loser's bracket is and how that works for double elim like that's really the only complication everything else is very simple and at the end of the day you know that whoever won that tournament is the baddest motherfucker in that room right mm -hmm. which is really what what we want out of that competitive format but um as an example, like my second Evo, they actually ran a different format for pools. What they did was, and this, I, this is at least for CBS2, I don't know if they did that for other games. Hmm. They put you in a pool of five players and everyone plays each person once and the top two make it out. Um, and that was really cool because no matter what, you got to play against four other people. I remember I had Valle, uh, I had this Japanese player named Dan and I had APOC and then like one other rando I didn't know of in my pool and I got to leave Evo and I was like, Hey, at least I lost to like some pretty strong players that I had heard of before. Right. right. And I got to play all of them. Like that was awesome. And CVS two playing best of one is fine. Cause that game is long as shit. Yeah. Um, really is. So yeah, there's a lot of room to, to like innovate and experiment with tournament formats and with comp competitive formats, but like, like you said, it's hard, right? Like we have an infrastructure that's set up to do tournaments. That's kind of the easiest format to explain to people. And like people are, are, are they're coming out for like at best, what, like one local a week, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like a super engaged player. So asking people to, to check out like alternative events is, is tough, yeah, right? Yeah, it really is. Because like, as it turns out, our time is valuable. And it, it, I don't know if it, hmm. Maybe this isn't true. I was going to just throw out a generality there that the fighting game community in general is older than mm. other. You know what? Fuck it. No, I'm just going to say it. Uh, no, the, the FGC is much older, just generally speaking. Uh, and as it turns out, older people have other time commitments in their life uh, that makes uh, maybe committing time to other things difficult. But. Anyway. I think also, like, certainly I, I, when I look at, at, at newer games and newer IPs, like when I see people who play cross tag, I'm always wondering, like, how old are you? Because because I do feel like some of the newer games definitely pull in a younger audience. Yeah. Also, like Smash Ultimate and uh, Dragon Ball, it pulled in a lot of younger folks. Um, but also, I think part of it is net play. Like, it used to be that you went to these tournaments yeah. because that was the only way to play against a lot of really good people. And now you can net play with a lot of folks, even just like good players who happen to be in your general region. And so the, the, the value proposition for leaving your house is different. Oh yeah. No, I, uh, I can totally relate to that, but all right. I, I, we need to, we need to move on though. Uh, I'd want to quickly touch upon, uh, before we kind of spin off into what would be the end of this show. Uh, but something that I wanted to bring up that maybe people don't, maybe people who don't, uh, aren't familiar with your prior work is that you've written the book and you've got a long history in writing uh, basically how-to guides on to how to learn fighting games because all of that information to me seems like it's out there. If someone were to search for it, if someone wants to learn how to play fighting games, that information is out there. Uh, so when I see things like, uh, for example, Brian F. made a great example video uh, mm -hmm. of this Ken player continually jumping in, swinging for the fences. All he had to do was just play solid defense and, and punish him for jumping in. That shit is out there. That exists. Like teaching someone how to kill a scrub is out there. Yeah. I see it n numerous times, but it, it just seems that, I don't know. It's, it's weird that things just keep, is it weird? I don't know. Maybe this is just me being, I'm breaking the meta a little bit. Is it weird seeing that stuff? being repackaged over the course of like two decades or three decades at this point. Like when I see so, James Chen talk, like, like if I want to actually learn about CVS two, I would look at a FAQ written by James Chen from fucking two decades, a decade ago. Right. Two closer to two decades at this point. Yeah, but yeah, honestly. <laughs> so, so some of it is just that like, there's nothing. Well, there are a few things that are truly new in fighting games, right? Like yeah. anything that we're dealing with now in Street Fighter V, we probably had to deal with a slightly different version of it back in Street Fighter II or Street Fighter III or IV or whatever, right? Um, there are always scrubs. 
uh, jumping in is is usually a bad idea. Like these things kind of te stand the test of time, especially when it comes to games that are kind of so tightly wound around their fundamentals as the Street Fighter series generally is. Right. Um, that said, like there is something specific about about uh, what Brian F is talking about in that online play style, right? Like Brian F is a tournament player. In a tournament, if you lose twice, you're out, right? right? And so the uh, the tolerance of risk that he is willing to take is extremely low, right? Mm -hmm. But for the for the the Ken player that he was playing against online, it's not like he doesn't he doesn't get locked out of the ranked ladder if he loses twice. He just needs to win more than he loses, right? At whatever ratio makes sense, you know, depending on how the LP works and blah, 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 blah. Like losing is not actually that punishing if you if what you care about is ranking points mm -hmm. because you're just supposed to win more than you lose and you will you will move up the ranks, right? Exactly. And so doing wild shit online is not nearly as punish is is not nearly as punishing as it is in in a tournament because like Brian F is like he, he's paying money to go out. He's got to pay the hotel fees, right? He's got to pay for a plane ticket. He's got to enter the tournament, right? He's got to pay for food while he's there. All of those costs, he just has to eat if he loses twice, right? But online guy can keep on doing online shit. And for the most part, he will get good feedback from that system, right? Yeah. So I do think that netplay yeah. actually does encourage, like even if you had a perfect lag netplay, you would still encourage some pretty wild swinging patterns. And like that guy did get to diamond, so it worked for him, right? Exactly. It just is, it, he will eventually hit a point where it doesn't. I feel like this is something that we specifically saw a lot of ever since 2009. I wanna say with it, like Street Fighter 4 coming out really caused that i don't know what you want to call it like a a paradigm shift in in certain players minds where players who are used to playing live went oh no there is this very discreet style of play and then players who have no idea what the other side of that play would be they've never had to reconsider oh uh maybe i shouldn't just continually try super risky attempts at at getting damage maybe i, I mean, need to stick to the and they don't ha, they don't ever hone the skills of well and, and this, is, this this predates street fighter 4 right like before street fighter 4 we had people still jumping in too much or waking wake up dping every single time um in cvs2 the big problem was just people who would roll all the time because roll is something that you can punish and you can punish it real big but if you're still new to the game it's very hard to punish it consistently mm -hmm. and the payoff for a successful roll in and then you get a super or a dp or throw or whatever was good enough that you get a lot of people who got some wins just by doing that right mm -hmm. and like back in the old days it was you had to play against someone who was good enough to punish these mistakes right and then either you learned and you figured out how to change your play and you did less risky shit or you didn't learn and you probably stopped playing because you'd hit that wall eventually right, right. but now with, with and, and again in the arcade days like you're paying 50 cents to, to jump in and get dragon punched, or you're paying 50 cents to roll a lot and get thrown or combo and super it or whatever. If you're online, you just queue up against someone else and maybe they don't punish you so badly for it. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm for it, but th that, that has been the, the whole mental split. So if you want to get better at fighting games, folks, try and think about it like a little <laughs> bit, just like a little bit. Well, so actually, one, of, one of my favorite techniques that I've seen people do in order to, to kind of, reorient the risk reward when they're playing on net play mm -hmm. is to give them an actual punishment for losing right yeah. so every time you lose do like 20 burpees that will make you feel the pain of jumping in much quicker and yeah. you'll probably end up with some cool muscles so that's cool <laughs> yeah to bring it up to uh two weeks ago uh after persia came on pchan a part of exo academy has a oh, yeah. Uh, do push-ups if you if you if she messes up the crouch medium kick into flicker. If she does crouch medium kick unto psycho upper, she gotta do push-ups. Good stuff. That's uh that's it, folks. Uh, all right. So with that, let's spin off into the end of the show. I have before I let you go, I have to ask you a line of two questions. Sure. Uh, and I think that it's a line of questions that really tells a lot about uh, someone's character, their person, their persona, perhaps. Uh, and it is this. So in any fighting game, what is your favorite normal attack? <laughs> I love this question for what it's worth. Um, so 
it's a hard question to answer because you have to look deep. You have to dig deep for this one. It's it's funny actually. So I came in in like I said, I came into competitive fighting games, the Capcom vs SNK two, and a lot of that game is about figuring out the good buttons. That yeah. game is more about footsies and poking than than most other fighting games of that era. And it's mostly because some characters just had buttons that were really really good. Yeah. Um, and I learned this by picking Athena. Her crouch fierce punch in that game is fucking ridiculous. And it taught me fundamentals. It taught me footsies, mostly because I just mashed the shit out of this button. And then eventually I would have to learn different like techniques and strategies for getting people to get hit by crouch fierce. So 100%, it's my favorite, my favorite normal attack. She does this really satisfying like eight when she when she uh, does the crouch fierce, crouch fierce punch, the animation itself is just this like super kind of whimsical like girly push. And if I beat someone with a bunch of crouch fierces, I will then do my own crouch fierce in front of them just to to show them like how ridiculous <laughs> I understand. This. Um, so Athena no, crouch fierce punch, the god. Uh, Athena is the bay for for CVS two, um, and that was like I remember there was this, so there's this guy uh, who is the Barricade's strongest fighting game player across the board. He actually made top eight at Guilty Gear at Evo two thousand three. His name's Eric Choi, and he beat me for probably over a year in CVS two. And I remember the first time I beat him just in casuals at the cabinet one day, and it was because I had started learning Athena. Um, so her fierce punch is like burned into my soul. No, I love it, and I specifically love that you brought up the fact that. Something that people don't think of that their brain definitely notices is the audio cues tied to moves. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love it. Uh, that's a good answer. I, I love that you, had, that you came prepared. Uh, yeah. Part two of the question, though, because this is a two-parter, is what is your favorite combo in any fighting game? Woo. There's a lot to choose from, I know. Yeah. This is This is tough. And you can, I've allowed people to have multiple answers in the past. I let people, you know, if you want to live your best life, you go ahead. <laughs> um, man. So there's, there's a lot going on. I just learned some basic chaos combos and there's a lot about having to do a, a lot of quick core circle forward and dragon punch inputs, alternating buttons that felt really satisfying. Hmm. Um, it's not my favorite, but th it, there's a certain aesthetic quality to it that is is apparent and that other players I've noticed have commented on when they see me doing a combo. Um, you know, there's there's classics like just like the Guile 4 Fierce or Street Fighter 4 Reuse, just like, you know, pretty much anything into DP FADC Ultra that just feels great. But mm -hmm. I think I'm actually going to have to go with Zero's Lightning Loops. Ooh, uh, okay. And right. so hear me out here. I, I am a Zero player in Marvel. Uh, it took me about a year and a half for two years of playing the game before I decided to uh, buckle up and just commit to learning Lightning Loops. And it was because... Uh, I've never considered myself an execution player, and especially playing CVS2. CVS2 is really hard for execution. Right. If you can do the the Bison paint the fence combo or the Sakura show 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 combo, which are all just really fast dragon punches, um, you have an incredible ability to just devastate your opponent that if you that you don't get an equivalent of if you can't do those combos, right? It's just they're super powerful. Um, and I never thought of myself as the kind of person who could do those combos well enough to like beat someone in tournament and lightning loops was a combo that like i spent maybe 15 to 30 minutes every day for a whole year practicing hmm. right the loops getting them on both sides getting different conversions and setups into the loops uh you know all these things like I, there's there's do you want to tiger knee the loop or do you want to do a very quick like jump and then the, the clean dp motion and there are kind of reasons to do both um i would i would like Kind of, I'd change my leg position. I'd, I'd like tense up different parts of my body to get ready. To wait, do wait, wait, wait. Yeah. <laughs> wait, you have to, I need to know more about this. What was the so difference that, in position? I need to know. I have, I, I to get, like, I have to get into the nitty gritty here. I'm sorry. Yeah, if I, if I was sitting on, uh, if I was sitting with my stick in my lap, you know, in like a classic tournament posture. Uh -huh. uh, Normally, my my knees would be flared a little bit. I have long legs, um, and the chair like the chairs are usually kind of low, right? So yeah. I flare my legs out a little bit so that the stick is kind of uh, you have the edges on um, 
resting on each leg, right? And I've got like a lot of space and stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I would get into the lightning loop mo mode, right? So when when he's when it's playing the cinematic um, that goes into the 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 super, right? Um, I would like I just like kind of like shake up real quick, right? Just like you know, like like make sure my 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 neck is like well adjusted, and I'd, I'd hunch over the stick, um, and I would actually feel myself like bend my knees inward a little bit. I can't honestly tell you why I did it, but it's something that I just picked up through training mode, and I would continue to do it. And I don't know if it helps or not, but it was just. It, it was this moment where it's just like, okay, I earned, you know, I, well, I quote, earned the hit. <laughs> most of his hits. Um, I earned the hit and I, or I got the hit. Now I need to do the thing, right? This right. is the thing that I've practiced for. This is the thing that I'm doing every day because this is how I win. Right. And like, so I played zero doom Virgil. My doom fucking sucks. It was foot dive for days. My Virgil fucking sucks. It was just X factor three Helmbreaker. but my zero would hit those fucking loops. And it felt so good to get them just because, just because I never, I was never the kind of player to win with that kind of stuff. Right. right. And then eventually what got me out of Marvel was realizing that there's so much power and I'd invested so much time learning that part of the game that I would just beat people who probably are smarter or better at the game than I was in all these other dimensions, but I wasn't giving, giving them the chance to play, right? And at a certain point, I was just like, you know what? I'm too old for this shit. Like, I'm not, I'm not here to win because I did this combo better than everyone else. And that was kind of when the spirit of Marvel left me and went on to somebody else. Um, it's great for them. I come back every now and then. But, like, I've never had such a complicated relationship with a combo as I have with Lightning Loops. But at the same time, your level, your general level of execution has increased. Yeah. You can't and say, I, I you can't say that you're, you're worse forward. off because of learning those combos. You're, in fact, much better off. You're in a better position. Yeah. It was, it was rewarding and it was, it was, it was a great learning experience. And at the end I moved on and now I can like kind of do the loops, but I, it's, they're bad. <laughs> well, you got, cause you're not in the correct position. You got to lock in. You have to, you have to fully engage into the, the lightning loop position. Obviously it's, it's, it's some real anime shit, man. Like I just, just <laughs> see my eyes like cloud yeah, out. Like, I don't see anything. I don't even cuts across. Like, what happened? It says I won. <laughs> no, I love it. I love the, the close in on the eyes and it's just that, <laughs> that vignette across and that's the sweat the little bit of sweat dripping down because you're getting into the the lightning loop mode uh that that's some real high score girl shit right there um, <laughs> i'm for it but anyway i gotta let you go pat but it has been a pleasure having you on uh talking about pleasure old games and talking about uh what you've contributed to the fgc and what you have continued to do so because you have a patreon am i uh, and it, that's still open that you're continuing to work on so you want to plug that perhaps as we spin off into the end of the show absolutely so uh it's been it's been incredibly rewarding to make content streaming and writing for for the fgc like i do a lot of guilty gear stuff but i also make a lot of a lot of content that i think anyone in fighting games can learn from mm -hmm. um, and i'm trying to help grow the community so a lot of the stuff is aimed towards new to intermediate le level players um so you can find me on twitter.com pat the flip if you want kind of the the daily ramblings uh, I, I post all my writing on my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Pat the Flip. Um, and all the money that I get from that generally goes to either support other folks in the fighting game community or helps further the work that I'm doing. Um, in, in addition, I also stream on Twitch, mostly Gear and Unist right now, um, but we've got a great community. Uh, so what I do is I host open net play lobbies where anyone can come and they can play with me, they can play with other people in the community. We have new players, we have experienced players, and people are just really good at asking questions, giving each other feedback, feedback, trying to, to learn this game together, which I really think is the best way to learn fighting games. It mm -hmm. honestly feels like a local community that just happens to live in my stream. And that's twitch.tv slash Pat the Flip. So you come over here, tell me that RSF sent you and we'll take care of you. Um, and yeah, thanks again for the opportunity. You've got a great community and it's it's, it's really awesome to be part of this podcast and just give it, get a, get a chance to interact with y'all. Cause um, I've seen, I've seen uh, how y'all keep the love for Street Fighter alive and it's honestly inspiring. Oh man, thank you so much. That uh oh man. Got me on my heels for a minute. Not <laughs> not you I'm not used to seeing love. I'm moderator on Reddit. Uh, 
<laughs> God damn. There's, there's a lot of love in fighting games if you know where to look for it, man. <laughs> that's absolutely true. There's so much. That's the that's my idealized FGC. There's those those big chunks of love that I like to cling on to in between Tuesdays. Anyway, folks, that's a show. <laughs> you can find me at Super Joe Monday on Twitter.com or at Reddit SF, which is the main Twitter account for the sub. Or just head on over to our Street Fighter and find me user joe underscore monday uh don't forget about the tournaments on mondays we don't have them on friday because the sfl for the west coast coincides on friday as well uh so check out what kamikaze warrior has planned he's got some some ideas brewing uh so tune into that uh but tune in next time for another edition of rsf radio but until then folks take care